This is Cheyenne, Wyoming, long known as the cowboy capital of the West. Founded as a railroad terminus on the banks of Crow Creek in southeastern Wyoming in 1867, historical Cheyenne survived a lawless Wild West infancy, during which time the cemetery did as much business as the post office. From a tent in a shanty town of 1867 to a thriving present-day city of 50,000 population is astute testimony to Cheyenne's survival and growth. This progress is reflected in an attractive downtown business district, as well as modern suburban shopping centers, and is headquarters for extensive sheep and cattle interests. It possesses beautiful homes, excellent schools, splendid churches, and is the political heart of the state. Today, although modern and progressive, the area's early pioneer enthusiasm and cowboy traditions are relived on an annual basis during Cheyenne Frontier Day celebration. One of the highlights of this week-long celebration, held the last of July, is the rodeo, which attracts amateur and professional rodeo performers from many parts of the West and draws thousands of spectators from all parts of the United States. Headlining Frontier Days is this annual parade, which features the development of transportation facilities in America since 1860. From the two-wheeled hand-drawn cart, ox-drawn prairie schooner, and stagecoach, to a replica of today's modern streamliner train. Concurrently with Cheyenne's establishment by the Union Pacific Railroad, President Lincoln and Congress established Fort D.A. Russell adjacent to the town to protect the railroad's westward progress from hostile Indians. As though keyed directly with Cheyenne's growth, the fort's frame and log buildings were in time replaced with brick structures, and it was gradually enlarged until at the time of the First World War it was one of the largest military posts in the United States. As the years passed, the fort had its name changed to Francis E. Warren, in honor of Wyoming Civil War veteran, first governor, and United States senator. Later, it was transferred from the Army to Air Force jurisdiction, with a fort dropped from its name and Air Force base added. The historical and economical impact of Cheyenne's military neighbor has played an important role in the area's progress. From the days of the arrow through horse cavalry, infantry rifles and artillery pieces, to the Atlas and Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missiles of the present, is an evolution few military bases in the United States can boast. It seems then only fitting that this military base, rich in historical background, and whose personnel roster once included the names of General John J. Pershing and General Mark Clark, should be chosen as the headquarters site for the support and control of the free world's largest combat missile installation, the 200-missile Minuteman Wing 5. The Wing 5 Minuteman program is the responsibility of the Warren Site Activation Task Force of the Ballistic System Division, Air Force Systems Command. These SATAF responsibilities, under the direction of Colonel William E. Todd, include construction, assembly, test and checkout, and turnover of the missiles, facilities, and equipment to the Strategic Air Command. Minuteman Corps of Engineer construction began at Wing 5 in October 1962 and was completed June 12, 1964. Some realization of the enormity of this job can be gained from these statistics. Wing 5 is spread over three states, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado, with 200 silo launchers and 20 control centers covering 8,300 square miles 
within a 130 mile radius of Warren Air Force Base. Activities included excavation of 2,700,000 cubic yards of earth and rock, 10,000 railroad cars of concrete, enough steel to make 60,000 automobiles, and some 2,200 miles of communications cable laid in trenches four feet deep. As integrating contractor for the entire Minuteman weapons system, the Boeing Company is responsible for the assembly, test, and checkout of the system's complete electronic and missile requirements. The logistics of this task are far flung and staggering. Utilizing a system test program in their Seattle headquarters area, Boeing assembled and tested every part of the Minuteman system early in the program to ensure adequate interfacing of all components produced by the seven associate and over 2,000 subcontractors. Missile assembly methods were also verified during this test program and put to work at the Boeing-operated Air Force Missile Assembly Plant 77 at Ogden, Utah. As a result of this test program, Boeing successfully carried these proven production line techniques into the field to Wing 1, Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. Wing 2, Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. Wing 3, Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. Wing 4, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri and its just completed task at Wing 5. In a pattern now well established, Boeing transfers its key specialist personnel and equipment from flight to flight and wing to wing to accomplish their assembly and checkout responsibilities. This efficient utilization of manpower has resulted in a steadily falling learning curve from wing to wing, reflecting accumulative cost savings to the program due to increased efficiency and declining manpower requirements. Significant proof of these cost savings are apparent at Wing 5, where assembly and checkout man hours were reduced by approximately 65% over previous wings. This unique Boeing production line is operated by a new breed of dedicated people, living a temporary existence in mobile homes far from their normal environment. These missile industry veterans have not only been able to adjust to varied locales and the uncertainties of tomorrow, but have actively participated in the civic affairs of many of their newly adopted cities and townships. While weather conditions influencing the Wing 5 construction area were generally good, sporadic winter conditions of snow, ice, and freezing temperatures presented many hazardous working and driving conditions. Since the farthest site is 140 miles from the base by road, it is not surprising that base vehicles averaged over a million miles a month in spite of these inclement periods. Faced with thousands of miles to be traveled daily, Boeing, as in previous Minuteman wings, operated a helicopter and pool car transportation system at Wing 5, utilizing an efficient radio dispatching system. Warren Control to Boeing Wilson. Boeing Wilson to Warren Control, go ahead. Bob, take those items from receiving up to the 819 building, will you? Roger, Boeing Wilson out. Warren, clear. The transportation problems at a wing of this size are quite large. Possibly one of the main reasons is the fact we cover such a large area. This can best be illustrated by the use of this map. We have a contract support area here at Cheyenne, Wyoming and our greater effort laid to the east of us. We had a dispatch area set up in the town of Kimball, Nebraska, and serviced the first three flights out of Kimball. At the time we were working in Kimball, we had a total of 648 vehicles here, and we're using two fixed wing and three chopper aircraft. Also, we were scheduling one truck out of here each morning and one each evening in support of the assembly and checkout effort. Our greatest distance involved was out to the far side of H flight, a distance of about 135 or 40 miles. All this lower area on the map lays in the state of Colorado. As our effort decreased in this general area, we moved most of our assembly and checkout crews up to Chugwater, Wyoming. This area is now being supported by one scheduled truck 
each day, one fixed-wing aircraft and one chopper. This effort is in support of S&T flights only at the present time. All these sites over this large area required three tractor-trailer loads handled from Cheyenne as well as all the smaller equipment installed by the assembly and checkout crews. Typical of the 200 far-flung Wing 5 launch facilities at which Boeing performs its assembly and checkout functions is Oscar Flight near Kimball, Nebraska. Here, not far removed from the old Oregon Trail at Oscar 3, the first position of a four-position, eight-day assembly cycle is in progress. During this initial stage of assembly, tools and equipment are lowered into the launcher, and site preparation tasks, such as the installation of security system equipment and antenna, are accomplished. Later, in the next position of the assembly cycle, launcher batteries and the motor generator are unloaded into the silo. While these items are being installed on the second level of the launcher, other members of the crew unload and position the electronic equipment cabinets on the first floor level. Following the emplacement of the equipment, third position crews route and emplace all the electronic cabinet cables. While distribution, jack boxes, and surge arrestor cables are being emplaced. Assembly of the retractor mechanism and the upper umbilical head and emplacement of the lower umbilical cables and the transducer amplifier group completes this assembly position. The fourth and final position of the assembly cycle encompasses button-up activities, such as lowering and emplacing the secondary door and actuator, installing miscellaneous power and communications cables, final internal security system activation, and leveling the LF floor. Once the assembly phase is completed, Scheduled checkout crews arrive at the launcher for the final phase of work prior to missile emplacement. Following each step of the checkout manual, crew members go quickly and thoroughly through the required checks. Typical of these is the run-through of the Versa Voice reporting system equipment. This Versa unit was designed to report launch facility malfunctions to the launch control facility. Versa consists of two audio reproducers, each, is, each of which has 20-channel fault reporting capability on pre-recorded tapes. To briefly de describe how VERSA works, we will use VERSA channel 23, which is LF equipment cooling air fault. If for some reason the LF environmental system were to malfunction, a sensor would detect this and send a signal to the programmer group. The programmer group in turn would send a signal to VERSA and activate channel 23. This same signal would be sent to the launch control facility and illuminate an alarm on the launch control console. Launch control facility personnel could then remotely interrogate VERSA and find out the nature of the malfunction. Maintenance personnel would then be dispatched to the launch facility to correct the malfunction. To self-test VERSA is a simple matter. All that's needed is an SIN headset Simply select the channel you like to self-test, depress the self-test button, and then the interrogate button, and listen for the audio readout on the headset. Other routine checks include bringing the launch facility up to a simulated strategic alert, in which all electronic functions of the launcher equipment are checked for operational readiness before emplacement of the missile. The production line techniques used for the assembly and checkout of the launch facilities is also employed in the complex launch control centers. The inherent activity in a vast program such as Minuteman requires extraordinary schedules and controls. These requirements are met by a system which enables the monitoring of day-to-day -day progress visually and provides the means for rapid identification and resolution of problems before they can disrupt the overall program schedule. This system is known as the Minuteman Management Control System. This management control system operates through a complex of control rooms. The focal point is the control center in Seattle, with control rooms at Plant 77, each wing, and the Ballistic Systems Division, United States Air Force, San Bernardino, California. At Wing 5, the Air Force and Boeing management are kept 
current with status daily from charts showing the changes of schedules, program progress, and possible problems. These charts of various sizes display all phases of the operation from major milestones to the smallest piece of equipment that is installed. The charts are updated as soon as the milestones are met. For instance, a missile becomes strategic alert. The dispatch area calls in and indicates to the man in the control room that the missile has gone in the green. The man in the control room takes the status and displays it on the statusing of the missile board showing S7 in the green. Then the status is displayed over on the detailed chart showing the missile in the green. And immediately after the control room has been updated, the manager at wing five is called and informed that the, of the change in status. And Seattle is also called and the management control center there is informed of the change in status. There were a number of significant dates marking important milestones during the Wing 5 construction. A few of these were June 12, 1964, marking the emplacement of the first Wing 5 Minuteman missile. July 24, 1964, when the first flight of 10 missiles was declared operational. And October 1, 1964, the date Squadron 1 of 50 missiles was accepted. The high point of the program, however, had to be June 1, 1965, when the 200th Wing 5 Minuteman was emplaced at Tango 6. This event not only highlighted the final emplacement at Wing 5, but also became the 800th Minuteman missile to be emplaced in the Minuteman program. The smooth, efficient, on-schedule performance of the Wing 5 effort that climaxed with the emplacement of this 800th missile is probably best summarized by R.W. Randall, Boeing base manager at Cheyenne. We've had what I consider a remarkable success at Minuteman Wing 5, both from a cost and a schedule standpoint. I believe this success has been achieved because of three basic factors. One, We've had complete cooperation from the military and all sub and associate contractors throughout the entire Minuteman 5 effort. We also have had some of the finest crews that have been put together on Wing 5. Their experience has gained on previous wings. Third, we've had marvelous support from the Seattle support organizations on parts, paper, and everything that it took to support the effort at Wing 5. These people learned how to support us on the first four wings and did a real fine effort on supporting Wing 5, the largest Minuteman wing in the A program. Turnover and acceptance ceremonies were held June 30, 1965 at Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, Cheyenne, at which time recognition was given the many participants in the program by dignitaries of Air Force industry and state. Among those attending the two-part commemorative were Wyoming Governor Hansen and members of the press and television. At an outdoor speaker's stand near the main gate to Warren, SATAF Commander Colonel William Todd acted as host and called upon the various dignitaries for brief comments to commemorate the occasion. Among those to address the public and guests was Brigadier General John McCoy, Air Force Systems Program Director for Minuteman. Governor Hanson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my boss, General Sands, I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about the job that's been done here because it's a wonderful feeling to have something so important go so well. And this is, as General Sands indicated, not only the biggest site activation task that we've had to do, but it's been done the best. As General Sands said, it's a 
200 uh, silo missile wing, which is the biggest one we've tried. It brings a force up to 800 silos out of a total of 1,000 that we're building toward. And it was completed not only on schedule, but uh, 15 of the 20 flights were completed ahead of schedule. General McCoy went on to tell of the tremendous coordinated effort involving not only SATAF, the Air Force Corps of Engineers and Industry, but the Air Force Training Command and the Strategic Air Command as well. On the subject of Wing 5, costs and schedules, General McCoy had this to say. Many times you can hold a schedule or uh, buy time with money. In this case, the job was not only done ahead of schedule, but under the budget. And it is becoming more and more important all the time to us to consider how much something costs as well as how well we do it. And I have the Boeing company who had uh, the biggest job among the <coughs> coordinated team of contractors uh, performed this task more than six million dollars under their contract. And uh, this means a lot to taxpayers. It also means a lot to the Boeing company. Because of the size of the Wing 5 program, many people and man hours of work were involved. General McCoy had these remarks about the Wing labor management record. I want to pay a tribute to the labor management relations here, uh, and that tribute applies to everyone because lots of people are involved in the uh, establishment of an environment in which labor and management work toward a common goal effectively. Less than uh, one uh, well, six one-hundredths of one percent of the total man day's work uh, were charged up to lost time to work stoppages. There was more than a million and a quarter man days worked here with only about 700 lost to this cause. And this is another record in the program and one that means a lot to the country. General McCoy concluded his remarks with the presentation of a symbolic Wing 5 key to General Lyle, the commander of the 13th Strategic Missile Division of the Strategic Air Command. In his brief remarks of acceptance, General Lyle read congratulatory telegrams from General J.P. McConnell, Chief of Staff, United States Air Force, and United States Senator Millward L. Simpson. The outdoor turnover preliminaries were followed by a luncheon for invited guests at the Warren Officers Club. At the conclusion of the luncheon period, SATAF Commander Colonel Todd once again resumed his role as Toastmaster to introduce several dignitaries who made significant contributions to the overall Wing 5 effort. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to change things around just slightly because it's come to my attention that uh, one of our honored guests and principal speakers has to catch an aircraft to go to the western part of the state. So I'm going to call upon His Excellency Governor Clifford Hansen for some comments at this time. Governor Hansen. Good afternoon. I can assure you what I say will be said rather briefly. Wyoming is very proud indeed of its involvement in this major defense effort of our country. I hope that the whole world uh, may be watching today uh, as to what goes on here because I think there is a real message for everybody throughout the world to know something of America's determination and ability to follow through on its commitments. It's been a real pleasure and a great opportunity for me to be privileged along with other Wyoming people in working with you great people of the Air Force. Governor Hansen reaffirmed the great dispatch and economy with which Wing 5 had been established. And he concluded his remarks by emphasizing the outstanding accomplishments of Colonel Todd in pursuing his SATAF responsibilities. And now, at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Lyle Wood, Vice President of the Boeing Company, Aerospace Division. And Lyle, I have some comments from you. Governor Hanson, General Welch, General Lyle, General Sands, General McCoy, and Colonel Todd, and distinguished guests. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'd want to say merely that it is a tremendous satisfaction to the Boeing Company to have had a role in the creation of this Minuteman 
weapon system. Mr. Wood expressed his appreciation to the people of Wyoming, as well as those in neighboring states, for the fine manner in which Boeing people engaged on the program had been received. As you know, we have had well over 1,000 people, employees directly concerned with the program here. I believe the figure indicates that we have had about 1,600 children in your school system. Now, one of the most important things when we have a workforce of this kind in the field has been the satisfaction which the wives and families derive, because if the wives and families are unhappy, it's hard to get a good, efficient job from the working force. And in this respect, this community and your neighboring communities have been outstanding. Our people have been extremely happy here and have felt that they have the utmost cooperation of everyone concerned. Following Mr. Wood's remarks, a number of awards and presentations were made by Mr. Dick Chambers of the Federal Mediation Service in Washington on behalf of the Secretary of Labor, Willard Wirtz. During the end of the ceremonies, Colonel Todd made two final awards. The first to Colonel Floyd Wickstrom, commander of the 90th Strategic Missile Wing, commemorating the completion of the first four-squadron Minuteman Wing in the United States Air Force. Colonel Todd concluded the ceremonies with the second award. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> this concludes our luncheon and ceremonies. There is one thing that I would like to say. I have just been informed that <clears throat> Mr. Robert Randall has been awarded the Air Force Systems Command Commander's Award for his outstanding efforts on the behalf of this job here. Unfortunately, we don't have the plaque yet here, but uh, this will be awarded to him at a later date. Congratulations, Bob. Today you've seen the delivery of the 5th Minuteman Wing at Warren Air Force Base, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Little can be added in summary to what has already been said regarding the effectiveness and dispatch with which this wing was established. The future of this weapon system and all similar instruments of deterrence is probably best summarized in the telegram from Senator Simpson of Wyoming, which was read at the ceremonies. It said, in part, All of us await the day when there will be no longer a need for missiles, but that day will not be upon us in the foreseeable future. Until we can assure through diplomacy a peace with honor, the safety and security of all Americans rest with our military establishments and particularly with weapon systems such as this, headquartered here at Cheyenne.